we had originally talked about doing 60 second review on this movie this week. However, it changed. We really wanted to talk about this movie. The movie changed this for us. I can't emphasize this enough. I would love a director's commentary to see where Joel Smallbone made contributions, but I'd also like to see what Richard Ramsey did. I'd like to see how they talked and kind of forged this tale. We have to make them look perfect because there was some conflict between some of them. This isn't Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Jesus edition. Hi, I'm Teresa. Welcome to Cocoon Cast, where we deep dive into movies and discuss all things cinema. Hi, I'm Rebecca. Today we'll be discussing the new movie, Unsung Hero. Rebecca, let's get started. David Smallbone has everything going his way in the land down under after agreeing to promote the biggest Christian music singer in the world, and he can't wait to share it with his family. However, after a series of increasingly bad circumstances, the whole family finds themselves starting over on the other side of the world in the U.S., with this new series of obstacles to overcome, can the Smallbone family summon their courage and faith to succeed? Rebecca, we had originally talked about doing 60 second review on this movie this week. However, it changed. The movie changed this for us. I can't emphasize this enough. You and I were in the washroom and you're like, hey, do you want to do a full review of this? Because I really want to do a full review of this. Which is funny because we had reviewed challengers just a few hours earlier we were done we were happy with it box was going to start editing and we said let's go back to the studio let's talk about this movie if you're in the christian faith community and you know the ccm scene the christian contemporary christian music scene this is going to be a must-seen movie for you you grew up in this camp under the whole ccm christian music you grew up listening to a lot of christian music you knew the songs they were singing. You knew the artists. You had talked about a ton of Easter eggs. <laughs> There's a ton of Easter eggs. And lots of big hair, right? Early 90s. Striper, hello, everyone. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It, well, it, it's funny, right? It kind of takes you back. But I would say if you don't know the story of Rebecca St. James or King and Country do you think people would be lost? I think people might be a little bit lost. You're showing also showing some bands that have a general concept. I mentioned Striper earlier. They're a very popular hair metal band at the time. So you kind of get the idea. This is the late 80s. This is kind of the end thing that's in now. Here's somebody that thinks they can do kind of what, what became like dance music. And that was popular. So they give you really good winks and nods to kind of follow the, like the trends and everything that was going on at that point. It didn't feel dated to me, though, right? Because a lot of the music like Striper and Petra and back in the day, you know, they talked to Eddie DeGarmo. And it was funny because it didn't feel overly dated, dated, meaning the Smallbone family came from Australia with nothing. Literally. And they really talked about the resiliency of family they talked about music, and even the music didn't start off right away. It's not like, okay, we're here, feet are on the soil, here we go. I mean, there's this whole story about the dad and the mom and the siblings and how they came together as a family and just the hard work and, as you said, the faith that they could survive, not knowing what that would even look like. I liked how they made everything so real. It wasn't a cheesy, oh, we got here, we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. It was, no, we were struggling. This was our family. We had to reach out and form a community. And that community yes. very graciously wrapped their arms around us. I think I remember something about Rebecca St. James talking about she was a member of that church at 19. So yes. it's really nice to see that loving tenderness that the family talks so highly of highlighted in the movie, not just the family members. I appreciated that. I agree with that. I appreciated that there was some suspense. Like we said, even if you kind of know the story and you know the music, theater was packed. I know this movie had an early screening a few days prior. We weren't able to make it, but our theater was packed. People were excited. I There were a lot of serious moments and real touch and go moments. It was so quiet. You could hear a pin drop. People were engaged. I really appreciated that because I was so worried this was going to turn into a little cheese fest. There were going to be moments people laughing at the serious moments and they were going to be played for comedy. I was really pleasantly surprised. 
the quality of the acting I was surprised about the amount of production value the amount of detail that went into this movie i think the acting acting as we know right can make or break a movie and even if it's a compelling wonderful story it's like oh this family people that you know our cinema community may know may have listened to their music and then the acting falls flat i was compelled the whole time i had to jump up at one point early early on i'm like oh my gosh i need to use the restroom <laughs> movies a few hours long i thought okay and i ran out and ran back in i you know was under the impression i kind of nudged you and you said no 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 you didn't miss much you're good but beyond that i was compelled the whole time i wasn't bored and as you said there wasn't a lot of cheese it, it to be clear we're talking about real issues depression we're talking about pride we're talking about failure not measuring up fear, anxiety, and obviously faith informs the small bone family. That's the wonderful piece. However, there were other real strong realities, really hard work. How are we going to make it? There's a scene where they have this little jar and we're talking a little jar and mom says, this is all the money we have. They didn't have furniture. They didn't have any guarantees of jobs despite looking and they all came together as a family and started to work together doing hard work. I want to point out there's probably only two people in the film I recognize. And one of them is Joel and he is playing his father. And he's not singing. The last movie we yes. saw him in was Return to Bethlehem where he was singing. He was acting. Yes. And he actually did a good job at that. And for a cinema community who doesn't know who Joel is, did you want to explain that? Joel is one of the two brothers of For King and Country. There's three major musicians in the Smallbone family. The first is Rebecca St. James. That's her artistry name. There's Luke and Joel Smallbone. They form the duo known as King and Country who produced this film. The other part that I thought was really interesting too is there are seven siblings. They talked about, because this was back in the early 90s and the mid 90s, so we've had some time. King and Country came on the scene a little bit later because Rebecca St. James, their sister, is the older sister. But what I really loved about it is George Clooney. <laughs> there was an epilogue, a wonderful epilogue. It wasn't overly inflated, but it was, here's the person, here's what they've done. And as a family, they really come together. One's producing, one's directing, one's editing, one's, the, you know, dad's the manager. It really is a family affair. And that's not to say that there aren't moments where, you know, families don't get along. They get into that, too. It's they pretty do. real. You're like, yeah, I, I could relate to that. <laughs> but I, I appreciated that, that mom was, we need to try to do this. And I could understand dad bringing his family halfway across the world with no prospects having lost financially everything i i i've i've had family members that have experienced extreme hardship and what he demonstrated i know you had said you're like wow that that feels familiar or that that reminds me of and I was able to go, yeah, I remember that because they're my family members too. And to go, that was very genuine and very emotional, but it didn't feel like it was played for effect or, you know, like some movies you kind of feel like, ah, they're manipulating the audience or they're, you know, spoon feeding them. It's like, you must believe the next thing we're going to tell you, or <laughs> we're just going to play it for effect, but we don't really believe it. I thought, wow, some of it was understated, but very powerful. And the dialogue was good. And there was some humor to it. There was some levity to it that made it more enjoyable to me as well. Yeah, folks were definitely laughing at the right points. They're quiet yes. at the right points. They had the audience perfectly just eating out of the palm of their hand. And that might just be the audience that we saw it with because <laughs> that audience is primo material for this kind of movie. I laughed. There was one scene that was pretty dramatic and they went black screen. And we were kind of laughing, right? Zone of interest, black screen, here we go. But so many movies can't hold tension well. And they put the black screen up and it was on the screen long enough that it was awkward and uncomfortable. But nobody said, oh no, what's going to happen? I'm like, oh, thankfully. And it was just 
coming in and it was like this fuzzy focus. We had talked about one of the artists for King and Country, Joel Smallbone, and he was one of the directors and one of the writers. And I think it was really powerful, the decision to hold the suspense to allow people to not know what was going to happen. And I appreciated that, that it wasn't people were talking, people were, like, oh, it was, again, back to so quiet. People seemed very engaged. And it was funny because once the movie ended, it was a real clear ending right after the epilogue, it, it was ending. A little bit of music, some home movies that were super cute. Then everybody started talking and chatting. And we had so many people in our theater outside just talking about this movie, but they held it until the very end. <laughs> just like you and I had talked about, we really wanted to talk about this movie. I would love a director's commentary to see where Joel Smallbone made contributions, but I'd also like to see what Richard Ramsey did. I'd like to see how they talked and kind of forged this tale. I thought the cinematography was just going to be you snooze it, you get it done, it does what it needs to do. It's actually really beautiful. I love the color balances. I love how the characters are framed. You immediately know emotionally where the director wants to take you. I like the fact that it wasn't distant, but it didn't feel intrusive. I know we've talked about some movies where you feel like you're like, I think I'm too close. It didn't feel that way, but it felt like you were part of the family when they would have conversations. But it didn't feel weird, like, oh my gosh, I'm eavesdropping, this is awkward. It just felt like we want you to be part of this. And to me, that's a hard thing to do in a movie with lots of kids, lots of action, lots of things happening. And it didn't feel like it was hard to follow. Like we were saying, if you don't know all of this backstory and all the music and things like that, it felt like it was, hey, you're, you're here come join us. We're going to take you on a journey. The best visual I can think of is, you know, the scene in Titanic where Jack and Rose are spinning. The scene where they're in the lower decks and they're they're dancing. Yes, actually, I love that scene. Okay. So if you watch the behind the scenes footage, it's literally James Cameron with the camera putting his hand on the shoulder, spinning around with them. Oh, that's an interesting piece. It's beautiful. It's one of my favorite just behind the scenes shots because it shows the intimacy and the personality that comes with filmmaking and the choices you make really translating to the movie. Wow, that's interesting because I love that scene. I can, as you're talking about, I can visualize that scene. That's what it felt like to you. Yes, because wow. it's over the shoulder. It's in the environment. It's not intrusive, but you just feel like you're weaving your way through it. Do we have any questions from the box? When we review movies that are kind of feel-good movies or movies that have a real positive theme to them, sometimes they have a real strong cheese factor. And we define that as they got to fix everything real quick. They can't let you sit in the moment and let you feel the moment. They just like, oh, everything has to be just fixed real quick. And it's kind of cheesy and cheesy cliche statements and stuff like that. What do you think about this movie and the cheese factor? There's not that much. It feels very real. I know Teresa and I had mentioned our relative's emotional situation earlier. The whole film was filled with moments like that. I, I don't even know if I would say entirely, though, it had a cheese factor. I think it had a positive factor. But to me, that's not the same as cheese. The cheese would have been, as we said, resolve it super quick not really get into the emotional experience or the really uncomfortable stuff. It's like, well, no, 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 we can't go there. We just need to make it all positive. We need to gloss it super fast. Or if there is a sad emotional experience, it becomes so melodramatic. You can't take it seriously. That I think is, is the difference. This movie, it really, like I said, it was relatable from my family's experience, but it was also relatable. It's just very universal. The dad, I mean, we laugh with the box, right? The box is one of Fox's favorite movies is Cinderella Man. The thing is, I can't afford to, uh, I can't afford to pay the heat. I got to farm out my kids. Oh, I see where you're going with this. Go, go on, go on. But that's the whole thing, right? It's, it's inspiring. It's encouraging. It's like, what do, what do you go through as a man? I went on public assistance. I signed on at the relief office. They gave me $19. <laughs> I need another $18.38 so I can pay the bill and get the kids back. 
And it didn't downplay it and it didn't make mom going, I've got this, dad's having a hard time. It's, I need to help take care of my family. But it felt like they were both fighting for their family. And when he was struggling, she would lift him up. But she also said, hey, this isn't okay to say this, this, and this. It's not okay to do this, this, and this. And the same thing for him, to just be honest, he wasn't a saint, even though clearly the family loves their dad. Two of his kids were working on this movie. They love their dad, but they didn't Pollyannaize him or make him something that it really sounds like he wasn't at the time. He was really struggling very hard. One of the things I also liked is they there's a lot of negativity he does bring into the film. Yes. But a lot of his negative points have grounding in reality. It's not like he's being negative for the sake of the film having a bad guy or something to that equivalent. Correct. It's not like one person has to be good, the other person has to be bad, or I can't hold both. And I think that's the part that made it so powerful because we realize he was acting as his dad. So Joel Smallbone actually played his dad. We see a cameo of his dad later. So he's on board. He's like, yeah, I guess that's me. But I was laughing because how hard would that be? You lived through it, but then you were portraying your dad. So you want to respect that piece, but you also want to be honest. I appreciated that. So it's not one family members coming out and saying, okay, I'm going to do this movie about my family. It's the entire family is behind them doing this movie and saying, let's put this out there. Hopefully this can be an encouragement and people can understand where it is we came from and how hard we work to get here and how faith informed the decisions we made to be here. Do we have any other questions from the box? This movie is about a musical family that are have large music artists with large catalogs. How did you find the balance of the music versus the drama and how that all worked out? The easiest trap this movie could fall into is just having music cameo after music cameo and just a track list that basically feels like a filler album. This movie doesn't. It plays its hands accordingly. There are moments where you're like, oh, I know that song. Or, hey, that, yeah, that kind of fits. It's not, oh, they spent the money on the soundtrack, right? I appreciated that because, as you said, especially with the artists, right, Rebecca St. James and For King and Country, they could have easily just said, our music will tell the story. Because their music is pretty much, it tells stories. I mean, it's not lightweight music. But I appreciated they actually let the actors do the acting. They let the script tell the story. They let the circumstances inform the audience versus, okay, we're just going to play a song, gloss it over, and on to the next. I was really surprised. It, the only Michael W. Smith song you oh. hear in the film is the character Rebecca St. James portraying an audition. They don't have this big extended Michael W. Smith cameo. Even the Striper cameo makes sense in context. They're a band that David was promoting at the time. Correct. And that's the other part too, right? We talked about Eddie DeGarmo and he's there and their relationship is interesting. I, I don't want to spoil it, but it starts off one way. It ends another way. And that's even in context as well. And you see the dad growing through this I think the pitfall for some faith-based movies is to make people that maybe other people of faith would know, Striper, Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith, all these people that the faith-based community may go, oh, I know that person. Oh, I've heard that person. And as you said, they didn't overplay that hand. It was within context and it was just, oh, it's just a matter of fact. It's kind of a byline in most cases, and it wasn't, we have to make them look perfect because there was some conflict between some of them. This isn't Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Jesus edition. Exactly right. Rebecca, it is that time of the show. One to five moths. What do you think? This is a solid four moth movie for me. Wow, solid four. Number one reason. I wish there would have been a little bit more of a deep dive into some of the other members of the family, considering what we know about them now. They gave like little hints, yes. but I was just like, I kind of wanted to see a little bit more. I wanted to see some of their journey. If you're, I know you're going to be focusing on your mother. That's kind of the thing that's been coming through all the promo materials. Sure. But 
when you watch the actual film, you're, the mom is the thread that binds everybody together. I just want to see a little bit more of everybody else, too. I would agree with that. I Especially when you said the epilogue and you see what they're doing now, you do want to go, oh, it, but it wasn't like a, a teaser epilogue. It was, the, it was a complete epilogue and it ended well. It wasn't as if, where did it go? All right, I have one to five moths. They're back to see me now. Hmm. I feel like we've been doing this more and more lately. I would give it a four moth also. Number one reason why? And I won't say because you did. So <laughs> I think it was a real solid movie. And as we said, it didn't have the cheese factor. It was well balanced. It, it didn't feel overly dramatic and perilous. It felt very real and genuine. The acting was really good. I, th I think it is a great movie. Hey, cinema community. If you're planning to see Unsung Hero, we would definitely encourage you, comment below. Let us know what you think. Let us know who your cinema community is that you want to go see it. And of course, your moth rating as well. Thanks for joining us. We're always excited to create experiences to bring our cinema community together. Watch the notifications for a review of the new movie, The Fall Guy, on our Movies and More weekly show. Please remember to like, subscribe. It really helps us out and share our channel with your friends. If you enjoyed this movie review, you might click the link to check out our review of Civil War or click the other link to watch last week's show where we reviewed the Ministry of Unjudgmently Warfare. Remember, cinema community, movies are better, better together. together. Thanks for watching. See you in the next review.